So for those of you visiting this morning, um, once a year, maybe twice a year, I, I do an instant sermon. And um, an instant sermon consists of questions that have been submitted uh, over the last few weeks from members of this congregation. They've either come to Beth via email or they were dropped into this box. Um, and as, in typical fashion, usually what happens is that I look at these and the questions are so marvelous that there's no way uh, that I can actually get, well, yes, sure enough, that I can actually get to them in 15 or 20 minutes. So we'll see what we can do and maybe um, the ones that I can't get to, Beth actually suggested, hey, maybe we can have one in the highlights um, moving forward. So what I'm gonna do is um, read the questions just so you'll have a sense of the breadth of them and give me, you know, 10 seconds to figure out which one I'm gonna start with. Was Thomas actually a twin or is that just a nickname and of what relevance is that information? And who is Thomas, the twins, brother? How do you respond to Christians who say homosexuality is a sin? There's one that would take a little while. Since we've accepted Christ as our savior, he has redeemed us. What about Catholic priests who are pedophiles? There's another short answer. <laughs> of the parables, what speaks to you the most and why? What's the deal with the book of Revelation? It's <laughs> another short answer question. Why don't Jews think Jesus is the Son of God? How can we love the alcoholic addicts in our life without judgment? Parenthesis, I know, let God judge and keep our serenity. Al-Anon helps, but only minimally. Which two teams will play for the National League Championship <laughs> who will win? Is Jim Butler anywhere around? <laughs> okay, the Dodgers and the Cubs, and the Cubs will win. That will make him happy. Oh, which two teams will play for the American League Championship? Of course, that would be the Red Sox and the Astros, and of course the Red Sox will win, and of course followed up with who will win the World Series, and that would be the Red Sox. Okay, that was pretty easy. What was the story about Joel? Well, that's actually when Joel was uh, a prophet. And um, he was one of the minor prophets in the Bible. And um, like most of those prophets towards the tail end of the canon of the Hebrew scriptures, um, he's looking at um, what's going on and seeing uh, the world going to hell in a handbasket and thinking it's all because we haven't been faithful to God. That's all I know about Joel. <clears throat> Let's see here. Oh, my. This the whole time is going to be taken reading the questions. As personal faith and specific beliefs change, how do we explain this to others who distrust that? Members of my family no longer believe that monogamy is necessary nor required of faithful Christians. I try to be accepting but could use some help. Is there biblical reference for this lifestyle? What are the Phoenix affirmations and why are they important? Can you tell us how books were chosen to be in the Bible and are there one or two you recommend we read as long as they're not in Greek? <laughs> I love the combination of humor and, and uh, complexity. I have a question from our welcome brochure under the heading, Who We Are. Could you please help us understand why we're not born again Christians? How am I supposed to have confidence in God's plan or that he, she even has a plan when innocent lives are taken in overabundance while evil is allowed to flourish? Another short answer. How do you respond to people who say we as progressive and inclusive churches are cherry picking from the Bible? So let's go, what, what we all do. That's my answer to that. Uh, as a minister, when you're counseling a person and hear the following, how do you respond? I'm perfect just the way I am. That's how God made me. Implication being that this person never needs to change anything about him or herself. I can honestly tell me in 30 years of ministry, no one has ever said I'm perfect just the way I am. So I don't know how I'd answer that question. 
Uh, I have a fundamentalist friend who believes that my whole life was completely predetermined by God from the instant that I was created in the womb. Is there any biblical support for this idea? Is there any way I can tell her I believe that God gave us free will without causing a huge disagreement? Probably not. <laughs> How do you reconcile the Old Testament, angry, vengeful God, with the New Testament, loving, forgiving, affirming God? Well, actually, that's a misrepresentation of both Old and New Testament because you'll remember that the Old Testament also um, has the words in it that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and that doesn't sound very vengeful to me. So that's a very, mis a very common misperception. The Hebrew Bible is about a vengeful God, and the New Testament is about a loving God because there are, there are scriptural references that kind of suggest that God's not very wonderful in both sides of the Hebrew and the Christian texts. That's because it's influenced by the culture from which that text was written. Um, so that's a quick answer to that one. Uh, how does your initial vision for Bethel's development compare with your present and future four to five years from now vision of Bethel? I'll tell you after I finish my sabbatical. <laughs> I've been surrounded by illness and death in 2018. I was emotionally broken and very angry. The deaths didn't make sense. I sincerely questioned my faith. I even gave myself an ultimatum. If she dies, I refuse to believe in God anymore. Will God welcome me back in? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to, oh, there's one more here. We are supposed to love our enemies. Why can't I have that feeling towards Trump? Oh. <laughs> That's precisely why we are called as Christians to love our enemies, even the ones that drive us nuts. So Trump is not off the radar for us, we Christians. And it's also not just about feeling. If love was just about feeling, every one of us would be sunk. I don't know about you, but I don't always have a loving feeling towards the closest person in my life, my wife. Can I get a witness on that? Not about my wife, but about people that, <laughs> that you have. That's what makes us different that we will be bold enough to love our enemies. Now that might not necessarily mean agree with them and or like them, but love cannot simply be based on feelings because they're all over the place. You know, feelings happen. Love is a commitment and a choice. Oh, let's see. Why don't Jews think Jesus is the Son of God? Well, probably rabbis are the best people to answer this question. Um, and it's also whether the, the person who wrote this question is aware of it or not, there, there's some anti-Semitism in here because um, you can't lump all Jewish people into the, the phrase, the Jews. John's Gospel was the cause of the way in which Jews, that, that, that word Jews has just kind of been blasted out there as, as all these bad people that didn't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Actually, the Jews in John's Gospel was referring to the aristocratic religious leaders who were intimidated and threatened by Jesus' authority to speak as if he were God in the flesh. And so they wanted to snuff that out, shut that up because it would undermine all of their power and all their authority. So, the simple reason behind why most people who follow the Jewish faith follow that rather than Christianity is that they believe living according to Torah, the study of Torah, will actually yield the same kind of loving behavior that we as Christians believe if we follow the way of Jesus, that will happen. And, simply, Early on, you'll remember that the Jew, the Christian faith came out of Judaism. And you can imagine, just like there are so many diversions and differences in the Christian family, 
there were differences within that early um, movement. And there were those who simply didn't believe that Jesus was resurrected. And there were those who thought that the, the followers of Judaism believed that their Messiah could never be inflicted with the kind of sacrificial death that Jesus was. So simply because he died on a cross, that could not be their Messiah, because Messiah would never be subjected to that. So what's unique about us is that, yes, God did die on that cross and rose again and is alive among us through the power of the Holy Spirit. How are we even on time? Eight minutes till, okay. Um, let me say a minute, uh, say something about the, the question about the welcome brochure. Under the heading, who we are, could you please help me understand why we're not born again Christians? Um, I think in the, in the United Church of Christ, um, by and large, there are folks, I mean, I'll, I'll, talk from, I'll talk about myself. When I was growing up, um, there were um, folks in the community where I lived who believed that there was one moment in your life where you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you were changed. You could say the date, the time, exactly what happened. So there was a before and there is an after. And I believe that there are some people who are members of this church who have had that experience. For most of us, our experience tends to be more like you have a, uh, an experience that really confirms that there is a God and that, there, that love is the most important manifestation. And it doesn't matter unless that love is enfleshed in your human relationships. That's what Christian theology is all about. So, so that's what's, what's absolutely critical. And the born again language, at least for me, was used as a litmus test. If you cannot tell me when you gave your life to Christ on a particular day, at a particular time, you were not Christian. So that's why the welcome brochure says most of us, it probably should say most of us are not born again because in the United Church of Christ, there is so much diversity I mean, there might, you know, there could be folks in this, in this congregation and congregations around the United Church of Christ who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. Most of us don't. Most of us see Christian faith as being on a journey of following the way of Jesus. And sometimes we fall off. Sometimes we really mess up. Sometimes we do a terrific job and we're in community so that we can be accountable and supportive. Um, how do you respond to Christians who say homosexuality is a sin? Well, there would be two answers to this. There'd be the answer in my head, which wouldn't come out of my mouth, which is, you are theologically so inconsistent and mis un you, you're, you're missing exactly the essence of the Christian faith, which is love. And we could all spend all of our time going around wondering who it is that really is sinning and isn't right with God. But I'll tell you the real reason that I believe that homosexuality is not a sin is because in the tradition of the Christian faith, biblically texts from Leviticus and some writings from Paul's letters translate a word that today homosexuality means um, same gendered people being attracted to one another. In those days, there was a particular practice that was happening in pagan cults. And it was a prostitution kind of thing where sexuality and productivity was what was celebrated in some um, pagan cults. And there were boys who were forced to be there essentially as sex slaves, and that was the word describing that power-differentiated relationship. It was about the power, it was about the abuse, it was not describing two consenting adult humans. But because homophobia has been such a part of our culture, 
Don't you know that it's easy to just slip into the, the cultural things that we believe are wrong and all of a sudden find a, a reason religiously to make it true? For heaven's sakes, the, the, the Bible talks about having slaves. Why are we not more concerned about that? So I guess I would also respond as Jesus did. Make sure you take the log out of your own eye before you take the sliver out of your neighbor's. Uh, what's up with the book of Revelation? Here's my quick answer to that one. Um, it is a completely different kind of literature. It's apocryphal literature. It's literature that is written a particular genre where um, a religious leader has a vision of something. You could call it a dream. And the language that's used <clears throat> is so rich and so colorful and it probably has, oh, well, there's no probably, there are images in the book of Revelation that meant something to the people who lived at that time in the same way if if you ask them, why is it an issue to love Trump? They'd look at you like, well, I don't, what, what are you even asking? Because there was no Trump then. And so the revelation, the book of Revelation is pointing to stuff that's happening using coded language. Um, it, it, it's apocryphal language, it's kind of poetic, and it's, there's this like spiritual mystical guide who is, is not just describing. The synoptic gospels describe, here's what Jesus did, here's what, how people responded, here's how we want you to respond. Mysticism takes you on this journey and shows you things. Um, so unless you really want to do the work of understanding that genre of literature, there's not a whole lot that it can teach other than mystery is still important in the life of faith, which is exactly why I think the book of Revelation was put at the end so that it would say to us, even if you can't make a bit of sense out of this, know that you are never going to get everything figured out. That's what faith is. I probably should stop now. Um, although there are so many wonderful other questions in here. Anyway, maybe what I'll do is, is create some, some uh, questions in the highlights. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your questions. They are profound. They are moving. They are challenging. They are good. And so are you. And, and tell me what's supposed to happen next. Are we supposed to sing? Right, we're going to sing a hymn. We're going to sing a hymn. Okay. So open up your verse, I can know.